Amen, amen. How you doing? Looking good, everybody? We are studying the Bible here tonight. Anybody ready to study their Bible? We're looking at Philippians chapter 3. Go ahead and grab your Bible. Open it up to Philippians chapter 3. We have a group reading uh, that we do together to align our hearts towards um, the theological beliefs that we believe and because we believe that confessing things out loud has value. So if you can see the screen, why don't we read this together? Are you guys ready for that? Let's read these three statements. We believe the Bible because it is God-breathed. We study the Bible not only to know the Bible better, but to know its author better. We expect the Holy Spirit to illuminate this text now in the name of Jesus by faith. And if you are watching online or if you're in the room and you wanna get a text when we go live, then you can text the word study to this number and um, we will never ever stop texting you no matter how many times you say stop. It's, it's a lifetime subscription that cannot be changed. Just kidding. Why don't we read this verse together? Does it, wait, does anybody know the memory verse? Why don't we read it together? Why don't we read it? Does anybody know it now? <laughs> Let's read this together, including the reference. Ready? Philippians 2.2. 2. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Now, we left off last week in Philippians chapter 3, verse 11, where he said that by any means possible... I may attain, A-T-T-A-I-N, the resurrection from the dead, which is a moment in the future when Christ will return and our bodies will come out of the ground. It's pretty wild. He is saying that he not only believes in that, but that he is seeking to attain that. And then when it gets to uh, verse 12, it becomes even more interesting because he doesn't use the word attain there. He uses the word obtain, O-B-T-A-I-N. It's like I underline things in your Bible. I would underline those. We're gonna look at the, what those mean and explain that briefly here. Verse 12, where we left off, he says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. Perfect in Greek is the idea of complete. Perfect in Greek is the idea of being complete. He's saying, I haven't already obtained this He's saying, I'm seeking to attain this, the resurrection of the dead, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So what does he mean by that? What does he mean when he's talking about wanting to attain this future representation of the salvation that has taken place, but he is saying that he has not already obtained it? Well, salvation is extremely simple to experience and a bit complex to explain because of the way the Bible chooses to do it, which is very beautiful. What Paul is saying here, I would say, is that Paul has already attained a general salvation through Christ. He has already attained redemption through Jesus Christ, but he is saying that he is still seeking to obtain something from the future. We're gonna talk about that in just a sec. So Put that idea just to the side. We're gonna come back to that. What, what, what that means that salvation is represented with past, present, and future language all in scripture. Interestingly, the word obtained there is a passive verb in Greek. It is a passive verb. The idea is that Paul has already attained salvation through Jesus Christ on the cross, but he has not yet obtained the resurrection of the dead because this is a future event. That's what Paul's talking about when he says the word it there. I press on to make it. What's the antecedent for it? The resurrection of the dead from verse 11. Interestingly, you see that phrase pressing on in your Bible, but I press on. It's a really interesting turn of phrase in Greek. It's a hunting word. I press on like I am on the hunt. Um, I'm tracking, I'm mapping, I'm looking, I'm watching, I'm waiting. It's like this kind of hunting thing, you know, which I frankly know nothing about. I don't get the vibe that when people see me, they think this guy probably has shot some animals in the face with a gun. 
um, someone was like, do you want to go hunting with me one time? And I was like, no, I don't. And they were like, why not? I was like, because I want to look at my phone. <laughs> Can you do both? And they were like, not, <laughs> not really. It's also a racing word. So, you know, just like in English, certain words can mean multiple different things. This word pressing on in Greek can be a hunting word or a running word. And some of the theologians thought that what Paul was going for here was this running word. That's the way I see it. It's this idea that Paul has attained this great salvation, but he has not yet fully obtained it. So he's saying, I run rapidly towards it. We're gonna see a lot of language here about leaning out or leaning in. We're gonna look at that. So what does this mean? How can Paul talk about salvation in past, present, and future language? How can we be saying that he has attained salvation, but how can he be saying that he has not yet obtained salvation? How can it be possible that Paul is saying that he has had his salvation achieved by Christ but he has not yet achieved the resurrection of, de of the dead. How can it be that Christ has obtained salvation for all of us, but we have not fully obtained it? Well, I think the best way of understanding that is by understanding the four theological categories for salvation in the Bible. When the Bible talks about salvation, it's one, talking about one of these four sequential ideas, and they go from top to bottom. The first one is predestination. It's this idea throughout scripture that God chooses people. It says in the New Testament that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And this does not negate our choice and it does not negate the call, the open call of salvation because God is not bound by time. Time is a temporary construct. In case this wasn't already confusing enough, let me just add that in there, that time is a temporary construct and there is no more time um, once this is all over. Like how you can always know exactly where someone is if you have four pieces of information. If you have a um, latitude, a longitude, a height or a depth, and a time, right? Like I'm on the fifth floor of the Drake Hotel in downtown Chicago. There's your latitude, longitude, and height on September 1st, 2024, right? That's everything you need to know, right? None of those four things apply to God. So God is not bound by latitude, longitude, height or depth or time. And so that's why God can say in scripture, I chose you. And why he can also say, you chose me because those things happened at the same time because there is no time to God. Does that make sense? Um, is, that like, is that like asking if it makes sense at the end of inception? That makes sense? Well, did the top fall or did it not fall, Christopher Nolan? Like, we're two and a half hours in, big guy. I mean, justification is the moment of salvation. It's a courtroom word, and it's this idea that God judges you from this point on based on the performance of Jesus Christ, not on your performance. It's a beautiful word. You have been rendered righteous. The gavel has hit, and God has said, you know what? You have believed, you have repented, and now you have the righteousness of Christ over you in perpetuity. It's a very beautiful thing. Sanctification is the process that we are all in from the moment we are justified until the moment we are glorified. That is our lifetime after salvation. And sanctification is very important. It says in the New Testament, this is the will of God, your sanctification. Do you know that the Bible never once says that it's the will of God that you work in a certain place or look a certain way or even marry a certain person, you know. Well, the, the will of God, it says in the New Testament, is your sanctification. God's incredible desire for all of us is that we would be sanctified. The New Testament says that we are being transformed into um, the image of Christ from one degree of glory to another. And this glorious process of daily confession, repentance, and abiding in Christ is this process where each day we would remind more and more people of Jesus and point more and more to Christ. It's beautiful, sanctification. And then glorification is when we get our new body. And you know, I'm not saying you did a bad job on mine the first time, God. I'm just saying I could recommend a few improvements. Uh, 
I don't think it would be that hard for an upgrade. So that's what he's talking about yet. Um, that's what he's talking about there. Now let's talk about this idea of yet, which is not in verse 13 in the ESV, but it is in the NIV and the NASB. Let's look at this and just talk about that a little bit right now. He says, brothers, I don't consider that I have made it my own. What is he talking about? What's it? This, this general idea of salvation. This, this I have attained salvation. I've, I've, I've re, not achieved. I have received salvation, but I, have, I, I don't have it yet. You know, it's this kind of you know, I, a theological idea of, of, of already but not yet. It's this, I've been predestined and justified. I am being sanctified, but I have not yet been glorified idea. And it's interesting because in the Greek, in the best manuscripts, they actually have the word yet. And the NIV and the New American Standard um, 95 both have the word yet in there. And I think that that's a preferable translation from some of the people that I was reading on this topic. Brothers, I don't consider that I have made it my own yet. Brothers, I don't consider that I've made it my own yet. It's this beautiful idea of a humble admission of where I am, but a complete and total recognition of where I will be. We're like really in the deep theology now. You guys like this stuff? I love this stuff. This stuff is the best. He's like, yeah, 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 I'm saved, but I am not yet resurrected and glorified yet. It's like this idea of like, I haven't become the man of God I want to be yet. I haven't become the woman of God that I saw my mother be yet. I haven't been healed of that trauma yet. I haven't been able to completely defeat that addiction yet. I haven't felt the peace of Christ perfectly in my body like Isaiah 26.3 promises yet. It's this idea that you can admit and say, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I will be because I believe that the Holy Spirit is leading me. I already have attained salvation, but I haven't obtained it yet. I love that yet theology. There's something in there for somebody today. There's something in there for somebody watching online today. But one thing I do, he says in verse 13, I am obsessed with this verse. I love this verse. This, this, this second half of verse 13 is so good. You know how people always hold up John 3.16 at sporting events? They should be holding up Philippians 3.13b so people would think about this idea I love, I'm obsessed with this idea. But one thing I do, Paul said, from the legendary Mamertine prison, locked to the floor, hungry, waiting for food, only one door and it's above him. He thinks he has hours or days left to live. But one thing I do, he says, from the incredible place of faith deep within his heart, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. He's using the word forget there as a participle because I think we all know from life and living life, if you try to forget about something, you will what? Remember it, you know? It's a catch-22. You can't remember to forget. You, can't, you can forget to remember, but you can't remember to forget because once you're trying to forget, you're currently remembering. You know what I mean? This is why some of us have mistakes that we've made. God bless us in the name of Jesus, and we try to forget those things, and we find that they surface a little bit more. It's a different idea you can't forget, but you can be forgetting. You can't forget. You certainly can't demand that your body or brain forget, but you can always be in the process of forgetting. One theologian said that forgetting in the New Testament is the opposite of remembering. It's this idea of you can't forget by focusing on forgetting. You forget by doing the opposite of remembering, but the opposite of remembering is not forgetting. The opposite of remembering is straining forward to something new. The opposite of remembering something that you want to forget is not forgetting it. The opposite, the opposite of remembering something that you want to forget is straining forward to something new, which is what Paul is saying here. He's saying, what is it that you want to let go of and what is it that you are going to lean toward? 
He's saying specifically, I'm gonna let go of all these horrible things that have happened to me and I'm gonna lean forward to what God has for me no matter how close it may seem. I think of it in terms of like a rear view mirror in a car. I broke this one off my car. And when you're looking in the rear view mirror, you're looking where? Back, you're looking back. And when you're looking back, where can't you be looking? Forward. But wait a sec, I forgot, I brought my, uh, my favorite thing to put on the rear view mirror. You guys have these? Sm these black ice things, these smell so good. I love the smell of this. My kids get in my car sometimes. There's like fast food wrappers on the floor. They're like, why does it smell like this? I'm like, because dad's depressed, guys. I do not say that to my kids. I say it to God silently in front of my kids. These things are the best. Whenever I get in someone's car, and their car smells like this, I'm like, that's amazing. What does it feel like to be a person that like does things on purpose and plans out well? See, now we're talking. So when you're looking in the rearview mirror, where are you looking? You're looking back. And when you're looking back, you can't be looking where? Forward. God is saying to you today in the name of Jesus, you can only look at one thing at a time. God is saying to you in the name of Jesus that he loves you, that he's seen your past, that he's chosen you, that he has set his love upon you at the price of his own son's life, that he would gladly give you all things, that he has handed you the keys to the kingdom, that you are a prince or princess in this world and in the kingdom which is much larger than this world. And he would say to you today, you can only look at one thing, your past or your future. Which is the thing that matters most in the New Testament? Which is the thing that Paul is saying he's looking at? Paul is saying, I'm done looking in the rearview mirror of life. I'm gonna look through the windshield of life. Paul is saying, I'm done looking at all of these things from the past and obsessing over what I could have done differently or how I could have been different or how I could have made a better decision. Instead, he says, I'm gonna be looking forward. Now, he's not saying don't take time to remember things that God has done. He's not saying don't take time to remember all that. That's not what he's talking about. Obviously, that's what the Psalms and the whole book of Joshua is about. But what he is saying is there are specific things in his life, which are obvious and notable because he's already talked about them in this letter and there's specific things in our life and they hurt and they hurt a lot. And when they get brought up, they hurt even more. And so we develop coping mechanisms to move around them. And he's saying there's a better way of doing it. The better way of doing it is you can't forget, but you can be forgetting. And while you're forgetting, you can be straining. Everyone who is straining forward to what is coming in Christ is in the process of forgetting. You can't look in the rearview mirror and through the windshield at the same time. When you're looking through the windshield and you are straining forward to what God has for you, when you are saying by faith, I've messed up, slipped up, screwed up, and tripped up, but God has chosen me, he is sanctifying me, he has redeemed me, and he will glorify me. You are looking through the windshield of life theologically, and when you are doing that, you are simultaneously forgetting because you can only do one of those things at a time. What does he say that he's straining forward to? What does it say in your Bible? He says, I'm forgetting what lies behind, but I'm straining forward to what? He's like, I'm pressing on towards the goal. The goal here in Greek is a distant mark that you can look at. It's like the idea of like the North Star, or like if you played a video game, like World of Warcraft, which I think it's fairly obvious from looking at me that I played extensively for many years. My guild was awesome, so cool, RIP. When you play a game like that, they'll put something out in front of you in the game that you are following to get to the destination of your quest. That's the idea that Paul is talking about here in the text when he's saying, I press on towards the goal. He's saying there's a very specific thing 
that I'm leaning forward, that I'm straining forward to get to. And what is that thing? It is the prize. That means the award, literally, the award. And what is the award? One theologian called it the divine invitation. It is the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? It's a really iconic turn of phrase. It's a really beautiful turn of phrase. What does it mean? It means that God the Father, in the example and presence of Christ Jesus, has delivered to us a divine invitation to live in the way of Christ. That's what he's talking about. How beautiful. Paul sees the goal as being like Christ, not being wealthy, not having more, not having more time, not having more grandkids, not having more whatever. All those things are great. Paul views the goal, the North Star of the Christian life as the prize, the award of the divine invitation of God the Father to live like Jesus, which is really a beautiful thing. Augustine said, hold true with the affections of the minds and the habits of living so that one is able to perfectly in the possession of righteousness when advancing day by day along the direct and road of faith, one has already become a perfect traveler on the road. Let those of us who are mature think this way. If you were wondering why Augustine said they have become a perfect traveler on the road, it's because that's what that word mature means in Greek. It's actually the same word from verse 12 when he says, um, what does it say in verse 12? Yes, thank you. Not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect. That's the same word. It doesn't mean perfect like the way we think of it. We think perfect as without flaw. They think of perfect as complete. So I think mature is a fantastic way of expressing it. It's possibly a little larger than that. Complete. One Greek lexicon said that this word means consummate in character. He's saying, let those of us who are consummate in character, who are complete, who are mature, think this way. He's saying Christian maturity will result in different thinking, different ways of thinking, different types of thinking. Our best thinking got us to the places that we have been. And so we must, in the name of Jesus, repent, change our mind, choose to think differently. That's the idea. He's saying that those of us who are mature in Christ, complete in Christ, consummate in character, we will naturally already have been changed in our thinking. This is such a beautiful idea. And you know what's amazing? I have I've struggled with mental illness so much. I've read so many books about mental illness from Christians and non-Christians alike. And it's amazing how only 20, 30, 40 years ago, people thought that when you turned 18, you basically just kind of thought the way you thought and that was it. And now they've looked under microscopes so close to our brains that they see there's actual grooves in our brain, there's actual paths in our brain. And the Christian and the non-Christian books say the same thing, that our brains are neuroplastic. And when we choose to think a certain way, over time our brain develops these natural grooves and we follow them like paths through a forest. And the, the thoughts that we choose not to embrace are like paths in a forest that have grown over and slowly become less easily traveled. It's amazing. It's what God has been saying this whole time. People just didn't understand scientifically that it worked. We can change the way we think by disciplining ourselves to think the way that we want to think, which is we want to think like mature and complete Christians, which is a beautiful thing. And if in anything, he says, verse 15, you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. The word think there in Greek is not really as much of like a disagreement, like think differently, like, oh, you see it the opposite way. That's not what it's saying. It's basically saying like, if you have a different point of view, he's saying, if you have a different point of view, God will reveal that also to you. I love Paul's humility there because Paul's point of view is definitely the right one. But he's saying, if you have a different point of view, God will help you, which is true. And it's actually a really courteous and charitable way to deal with other people. You know, like if people believe in the rapture or something, which, you know, you shouldn't because it's not a real doctrine because no one believed it until 1850. If someone believes in that, you don't have to like walk up to them and tell them they're stupid. You can say or think what Paul thinks, which is like, bring that to God. I believe God will reveal that to you. Do you know what I mean? I believe that tonight by midnight, you will be sitting in front of a fire of made of left behind books, warming your hands. <laughs> um, 
only let us hold true. I shouldn't have mentioned that. Now that's what all the questions are gonna be about. There will not be a single question about anything other than that. Um, so I, I do it to myself. It's like I, that time I mentioned Catholicism for three seconds, then it's like 7.45, and someone's like, wait, 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 what about bishops and the Eucharist? Um, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. I do think there's something there. I think being charitable with other Christians about beliefs that are non-salvific is incredibly important. People ask me often why I do so much mockery of Baptists and Pentecostals and different things. And it's because in my mind, that's what family members do. And I believe that Catholics and Orthodox people and, and uh, Anglicans and all these people, I believe they're all saved. And so because of that, I feel completely comfortable joking with them, and I would hope they feel comfortable joking with, with us, you know? Like, it's so easy to make fun of Protestants, right? Like, we're like more concerned if the communion is gluten-free. And it's like, you know, if that much gluten is gonna hurt you, you should just go to the hospital now. My point is on non-salvific things, it's incredibly important to be charitable. And then other people will accuse me of being too hard on people like Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses. That's what the Bible teaches us to do, not to be hard on them as people at all, but to be hard on the ideas. Gatekeeping is a part of being a part of a legacy faith. Okay, I think I've talked enough about that. So verse 16, let us hold true to what we have attained. You see how he keeps cycling and circling back to these same ideas. It's this idea, if it lies behind, I will leave it behind. If it lies ahead, I will lean forward to it. Oh, that's good, I should have written that on a slide. If it lies behind, I'll leave it behind. If it lies ahead, I will lean forward to it. I love that phrase that he said, forgetting what lies behind. My wife and I were uh, dating in the summer of 2012, and we were at our church camp in uh, Michigan, in uh, Western Michigan, which is like so beautiful. Um, if you ever go there, go in the fall. It's so beautiful. Um, they actually have a fall. It's real. You know, if you're watching online, it's like it was like 108 degrees today and it's October. So we're all kind of just like, wow, like we get it, right? Like, um, and we read through the book of Philippians together and we were talking about it afterwards. And I said something like, what was your favorite verse? Which is a thing I love to talk with people about after we read the Bible, because I love hearing what people like stood out to people or whatever. And we both chose the same verse, and it was this idea of, it was this verse, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead. And she wrote me a note a few months later with this, this idea written at the bottom of it in her beautiful handwriting. And she wrote um, this, this love note, um, and at the bottom of it, she wrote, uh, forgetting what lies behind, and then she signed her name. And I looked for it for like an hour today and I couldn't find it. I found like 20 love notes, but I couldn't find this one. I wanted to show it to you guys because this idea is so loud and massive to me. Okay, let's summarize theologically where we have been so far in this text. Because there's a lot of ideas here. There's a, don't you think? Don't you think there's a lot of ideas here? Anybody? You're just still thinking about how a woman that looks like my wife could love a person that looks like me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've noticed a dramatic difference when I show up places to speak solo or when I show up with my wife. I, so, I show up solo and they're like, who's this bozo? I show up with Bree, they're like, let's give him a sec. There might be something to this guy. Let's give him, let's give him a chance. Okay, so I wanna um, just summarize everything we have uh, been talking about so far, and I'm struggling to hold all three of these things. So I wanted to summarize it because I think that this type of thing is really helpful, especially with Paul. When I'm teaching people Paul, I really want them to see that he's always making an argument. He's not like Peter who kind of just randomly says stuff. 
He's always making an argument. The argument is always coming from something and leaning towards something. He's always making a point. And um, let me grab this. Here it is. So what he's talking about here is he's talking about the same thing since verse 11. He's talking about the physical resurrection of the dead. Which we we could probably shorthand as um, glorification. He's talking about glorification, right? So now he's gonna expound upon that and he's gonna say a couple things about that. He's gonna say, I have attained it. Now, if you look specifically at the text, he actually says he has not attained it, but he's talking about, um, he has not attained glorification, but he has attained salvation. I have attained it, I have not, what? Obtained it, exactly. I have not obtained it. Then he's gonna go on and continue, and he's gonna say, so I'm gonna seek to obtain what I have attained. I am gonna seek to obtain what I have attained. And so he's gonna say, I let go of the past, I lean forward into the future to what's ahead. And what is ahead? The prize. And the prize is this divine invitation. Then he circles back and says, but I don't let go of what I have already attained. Do you see how he keeps coming back to these ideas? He's making a very, very straightforward argument, although it contains a lot of theological points. And then he says, I don't let go of what I have attained, but do you know what I do? I forget what lies behind, and I lean in to what lies ahead. That is his way of expressing, I think, kind of the summary sentence of all of these things that he's going for here. And then what does it say next in the text? It says, brothers, join in imitating me, which is hilariously ironic. Why? Because if any pastor said this in a sermon, everyone would say they were really arrogant, first of all. And second of all, if anyone, any Christian said this out loud, people would think, what do you mean? Why should anyone imitate you? They should be imitating Christ. Well, it comes out a little bit that, uh, in, in a few verses that there's kind of some ridiculous people there and he really wants them to imitate him rather than them. I also think it's ironic that Paul kind of exemplifies and has lived the exact opposite of what most American Christians would want out of their life he is poor. The religion of America is uh, wealth and greed. He is in prison. America is based on freedom, you know? Rock, flag, and eagle, bro. He has many haters, right? Like Paul's Twitter mentions would be a disaster. He's unmarried, he's alone, and he's hungry. Not all of these things are bad. It's not wrong to be unmarried, certainly not. Some people, it's the best thing about their life because God has called them to that. But for a person who desires it, it is very difficult. He is alone, you know? For some, some of us like being alone, you know? Some of us, when COVID happened, we were like, okay, like, <laughs> this is great, right? Whereas me, I was like having a glass of wine at 3 p.m. being like, this isn't sinful today, right? Um, Join in imitating me, and then look what he says next. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. You know, you move toward what you're looking at. This is another example of how he's saying the same things in different ways. He's saying, 
Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Look through the windshield of your life at people who are doing it well, not through the rearview mirror of your life at your past or through the side window at what um, other people are doing. Then he says here kind of the reason why he said the imitate me thing because he's a, he's a better example for them than these, than these people. He says, for many uh, who, of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. What does this mean? This means that people who were once Christians, one theological view would be that they have lost their salvation. Another theological view would be that they never had it to begin with and have turned their backs on something that they were always going to turn their backs on because they had never received it. Now they are walking as enemies of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. Would you be like that surprised if in like 2030 they put on a quarter like United States of America, their God is their belly? Do you know what I mean? It's so indicative. (laughs) It's so explanatory of... When was the last time you heard a sermon about gluttony? You should do one of those. Have like a McDonald's truck outside before so everyone feels extra guilty. Like, oh really, huh, what's in in your belly right now, big guy? Hmm, that's interesting. Um, Their God is their belly, they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. So what is he saying here? He's making three points about people whose end is destruction, the people he does not want them to imitate. Their God is their belly. What does that mean? Um, It means what it means literally, and it also means an expanded version of that. It means literally their God is the things that they want to consume. And then it means, you know, more than just food. It, It means anything, you know, anything they want to consume. And then they glory in their shame, which is actually really sad. And I think that, um, we see more of this now than we ever have before. You know, people posting videos of themselves getting into verbal and physical altercations with people in public, people publicizing um, immorality and and all, all sorts of things. And I think that often Christians have been unable to see that we don't need to like rush into those spaces and tell people to stop doing that. We need to thank God for the grace that we have received to live differently and pray for those people. Um, But he's saying here they glory in their shame and their minds are set on earthly things. These are the opposite of the ways of Christ, which is not my God is my belly, but God will transform my body. Not I glory in my shame, but I glory in Christ Jesus alone and not a mind set on earthly things, not looking in the rearview mirror of life but looking through the windshield and saying, my mind is set on things above. And so you can see how he's completing the idea here with these two simple statements, because he continues and says, but our citizenship is in heaven. What is he saying? Well, think about what he's been talking about this whole time. He's been talking about what you look at, what you choose to think about, what you choose to meditate on, what you choose to try to forget, all of this stuff. And he's saying, Let's just make it super clear. There is two destinations here, one of this type of person and one of this type of person. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Now, when it says that Jesus has a glorious body, it is not talking about what Americans think a glorious body would be. It doesn't mean that like Jesus is cut and like looks great when he's swimming. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't mean that. Jesus' glorious body is his crucified body. The glory of God was shown through the suffering of Christ. I believe when we meet Christ face to face, he's not gonna be ripped and jacked and Instagram ready. He's gonna have holes in his arms and that is the glorified body which is something really beautiful, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. What is that power? That power is a person named the Holy Spirit. And um, we're gonna continue on in chapter four next week. 
I'm gonna invite Stuart to come join me on stage. We're gonna talk about the meme winners. And then we're gonna take some questions. We have a few, we have a few good memes this week, Stu. How are you, sir? I'm great. Check one, two. Hello, are we live? Now, my understanding is that worship leaders never stay for the sermon, but you seem to do that. Yep. I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. All right, let's check out some meme winners. Here is the first one, probably made, um, by, frankly, by a boomer because of the choice of color of font. What does that one say, Stu? I'm gonna try my best. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. That's now, from Jesus. I did not understand this meme. Is the person who is here, is the person who made it here? It's you? Can you, were you, this was what, ironic? <laughs> oh, I get it, yeah, yeah. So you went with like, what's like the most aggressive part of scripture with this like ludicrous Lisa Frank image? <laughs> well done, I appreciate it. And then here is another one. Oh, that's a good one. Brad. You can go, if they don't have it for the screen, you can go ahead and read it off the slides, Stu, because I think it's visible there. On, Brad. On the TV. The TV. Yeah, right oh, here. Oh, yeah, here it is. Mm -hmm. this, is new, this is a new thing for me. Brad, when it's his turn to ask Landon questions at the Bible study. Now, I did ask Brad before if he's okay with these, and he said he loves the memes that are mocking him. And I said, someone in the internet comment section of one of the Bible studies accused me of bullying you, Brad. And he said, no, just tell him I love it. All in good fun, right? Brad, the Kanye West of this group, <laughs> loves being in the headlines. Meme kings. Here's our winner. <laughs> No circumcision required. Dan, the meme lord. Where you at, Dan? Come on up, you champion. Were you sitting right behind Rudy to threaten him? He sits in your shadows. That's yeah. true, as far as the trophy goes. Brad, yeah. you get the final of the trees. Smell or, uh, Dan, thank you so much. Thanks for the laughs. Okay, now we have a new template Stu, okay. for next week. Yes. Oh, it's not, I, I forgot to change what it says. It's not symphony, it's this, uh, this, this mini hippo. Have you guys seen this thing on the internet? You haven't? You should spend more time on the internet and less time reading your Bible, guys, because then you would know what this is, which is a cute hippo. Very cute. Would you adopt that hippo? If I had space. I just feel like someone would adopt this hippo, then like a month later, it would be like 1,100 pounds and 16 feet long, and then they would list it on Craigslist. I'd spoil For, it. Formerly cute it. hippo. Yeah. I made a meme of this. I wish, I wish it was original to me, but I saw someone who made kind of like <laughs> one similar to this. Um, no one is reacting, so that must mean that you don't know that Augustine, the church father, is from Hippo. That's the, that's the idea. So, original. swing and a miss. A original. It was, they weren't ready for it. Swing and a miss for pastor. It's not been my day today. You can't uh, use this one, though. Yeah, it, I wish that was original to me. Um, Stu, do you want to stay up for Q&A and hang? Sure. Okay, and we're going um, so to take questions, and we're going to invite um, Carly also to join for the Q&A. And um, have some uh, some more different people in the church who have gifts. Yeah, come on, scoot over. Have some more gifts to allow people to um, answer questions. Yeah. So I got a text that said that the live stream wasn't working. So I don't know if it's on. So we don't have any questions from the internets. So we're going to be relying on everybody who's here. So does anybody have a question? You can go ahead and raise your hand. And if you do have a question, then our, t our team of two, Sterling and Blake, will rush over to you at lightning speed and jam a camera in your face. Every Gen Z person's dream. The pressure's on. 
Does anyone have a question about anything we talked about tonight? Anybody have a theological question? I've got one over here. Ooh, from a man in a bucket hat. This will be good. Uh, yeah, it uh, should be a pretty straightforward question. Uh, I mentioned uh, straining forward. I was just curious as to why the use of the word strain, if there's anything significant about the Greek in that. But, yeah. Anybody? I didn't study that. I, can, I didn't study that word, but I can look it up really quick. That's a great question. What's your name? Sean. Sean, thank you. Now, are you like an everyday bucket hat kind of guy, or is it a once in a while kind of thing? Uh, it's intermediate. Usually work would not allow that. So Ugh, this is my real-time hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's check this out. So, um, yeah, end, end of 13. 13. Yes, forgetting what is behind, epilenthamomai, and straining forward, reaching, reaching. forward, epictinomai, from epi and ecteno. It's only used one time in the whole New Testament, which is, which is rare. Um, it's defined as, uh, it's used using the middle voice to stretch oneself forward upon. Ooh, that's good. I should have looked that up. Pressing on. Too. Yeah. 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 Anybody have any thoughts about that? Got one in the middle. Is that is that suitable? That's good. That was pretty bad. I mean. I mean, I, it's just a definition. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we did not literally nothing that you could not have done, so we failed you. Sorry. We failed you. I would say we did our best, but we didn't. <laughs> oh, question from Monty. This is going to be good. It's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> we can just we can just lay all that down right now. <laughs> I in this straining forward, pressing on. If it was for the divine, for He Himself. Christ was the goal, and not the imitation of Christ, is that I would push towards Jesus, look towards Jesus on a daily basis, throughout the day, every morning when I get up, I would go looking for him and pressing into him, to know him, to have him, and to hold him as my prize. I it's good. really tried to imitate Christ for a long, long time, and I am just horrible at it. So I started looking for him, and I was taught and assured that the more I drew close to him and the clearer I saw him, that he would perform the work in me and make the change. Yeah, I would agree. I think the leaning in, because he calls us to lean towards him and he'll lean back towards us. Yeah. Money, you belong up here. <laughs> that was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> got another question? We got one right here, Josh. Um, one thing uh, related to timeline and the concept of time and God being outside of that. Um, if God is all-knowing, which he is, and outside of that, and knows the way that everything's going to go, what is, I get, one thing I struggle with is, like, he, you know, created everything, and obviously um, there are some not-so-good parts of this world and, and everything, and, like, did he know that Satan would fall before he created him? I believe the answer is yes, according to, you know, everything I've read. But 
I guess, do you have any comments on that, or is that a reasonable thought to struggle with? No, that's good. Lynn, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, I had heard it spoken a long time ago that Jesus was never God's plan B, that he was always God's plan A. And that really helped change the perspective of, of my thinking towards um, the understanding of God and his creation and the role of Jesus in his sacrifice. Um, but absolutely, I 100% believe that God knew every single thing that would ever take place the second that the earth was created. And that, to me, makes the sacrifice of Jesus all the more precious um, and the willingness of him to to uh, raise his hand and say, I'll be the one, I'll, I'll do it. Um, not because of the act of Adam and Eve, and he went, oh, what do we do now? Okay, well, I guess I'll, I'll do it. But it was always the plan. Um, and yeah, that to me just makes Jesus so much more of a prize. Yeah, I think um, I think everything in the um, it, you said is that a is that like a good thing to think about? I think that's the greatest thing that the most Christians have spent the most time pondering from the ascension of Christ until now. So yes, Josh, absolutely. I think that for me, the way I think, everything hinges upon if God um, wanted robots or if God wanted people who could make their own decisions. And this is ultimately why I'm not a five-point Calvinist because I don't think you can be and simultaneously effectively believe that people can make their own choices. That's my point of view. And because God chose that he didn't want robots, because God chose that he wanted the chosen worship of a few rather than the robotic worship of everyone, because of that choice that God made, by the very nature of making that choice, he had to allow for the rest of the things in the realm of reality. And so because he promises to sew everything together for the good of those who love him, like you, I just think that that makes it even more amazing. Thank you. We got another one down here on the front. Let's go. I also just want to point out that the, the guy who said he didn't have a question, Monty, who had the amazing just kind of like statement, he's like, his posture is so bad. He's laying down all the way in his chair. I can barely even see his face. He's like, he also is like one of the, something. he's also like one of the top three most prophetic people in this church. And I want to get a t-shirt with his face on it. So because you brought it up, and um, it's always been a question that I've wondered because my wife was one of the ones that was like spoon fed the, um, the Left Behind series as a kid. So I just wanted to know what is the obsession with Christians and the rapture and things? I've never understood it. Why do we obsess over the end, especially on social media and Twitter, so. Mm. I think that there's, I mean, this is just maybe my opinion. I mean, we're so insecure that we want sometimes artificial hope where it's not based on truth. Um, and we, we kind of pick and take from what we, in our own filter, maybe not an educated filter, but our own filter or naivete mindset where we pick and grab things that we want to believe and we put it together and we maybe it's this and that's what I feel like I want to believe and then you write a book about it and then people believe it and I think it just also proves that in today's the majority of the American Western Church has not been taught to be students of Scripture for ourselves we have sat under teaching of men and women who have done it for us, but we have not been challenged in ourselves to pick up our scriptures, to do the work, to look up the commentaries, to 
you know, the things that we have full access to, but are, quite frankly, too lazy to do. Um, and so it, this is honestly something that Landon's own um, take on this is something that I'm currently studying and researching myself because it's a new concept to me, honestly. Um, but I think it's something that is so fascinating. And once you begin to get a taste of reading scripture and allowing scripture to um, come alive to you in a new way, Netflix becomes a lot less appealing <laughs> because you're just like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't read enough, I can't learn enough. And then you feel empowered to become a true disciple of Jesus and actually study the word for yourself instead of just consume it or hear it and then leave and live your life until the next Sunday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are both really good answers. I think, you know, I have no problem with the left behind books artistically. I actually think they're actually pretty entertaining and really cool. And I wish more Christian art was good, brave, interesting, and uh, leading the way for different genres on different platforms. The, I have a problem with it theologically, and the problem I have with it theologically is that there is no theological truth that people didn't figure out until the 1800s. So there is no piece of truth that none of the church fathers addressed or talked about, none of the medieval mystics or church mothers talked about, none of the Reformation fathers talked about. There isn't a single word from Augustine, Origen, St. John of the Cross, John Calvin, Martin Luther. Not a single person ever addressed this in any way because it was not a doctrine that existed. And so because of that, anything like that, I just unilaterally reject immediately. I don't even really think about or process it. I just, there's no chance to me in my mind that anyone is figuring anything out now that all of the greatest theologians in history never understood. Because that's, that's crazy to me. And then I think secondarily, it was, uh, to answer your question specifically about why it has captivated so many people, it was a, a doctrine that was created by a, a guy named John Nelson Darby in the 1840s or 30s or 50s or something. And there was a woman who had a, an ecstatic vision of God, a uh, prophetic vision, and shared it with them. And the vision was of a second additional return of Christ, because for all of Christian history, there was only one return of Christ, which is the return of Christ that we see in the New Testament passages. And um, it's also funny because a lot of people that believe in the rapture also don't believe that women can be prophets or teach and preach. And so that's so funny to me because they're believing a doctrine that came from a woman, but I don't think they know that. I have no problem with that. You know, Joel 2 says in the end times, men and women will prophesy and dream dreams. I think that that's awesome. That being said, specifically, the rapture is the removal of the church before any of the wrath of God, and it's a very comforting, easy thing to believe. So, plus, I mean, what, movie, what, 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 what theological point has a movie with Kirk Cameron and a movie with, uh, what's his name? What? Kevin Spoodbell? No, Nicolas Cage. That's the Nicolas other one. Cage. So good. The newer version. Yeah, so good. Love that guy. All the good movies he's in, he's amazing. All the bad movies he's in, he's amazingly bad. It's so good. He's all or nothing. I love it. You can hate watch the one half and laugh, and you can love watch the other half. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, thank you guys for joining me. Thank you for that question. Thank you guys for being here. All of the questions are on the screen. I've also texted them to your table leaders. If your table leader does not have the questions, they are not an official table leader. You don't have to listen to anything they say. Um, <laughs> and thanks for coming during fall break. Fall break is a mirage. Um, we'll see you guys later.